The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for this day and the opportunity to be together. As we open up the prayer book and talk about these words that help guide our worship and influence our lives, we ask that you inspire our conversation. Keep our eyes fixed on you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. So, uh, I confess this date is wrong, so this is the only mistake I'm going to make all day. Um, let's see, I'm not preaching, so I don't actually have a lot to do today. Um, we're talking about the prayer book. Um, and so... We've got a large print version over here. I actually forgot mine, but it's available on your phone. I, we'll talk about it. I've got a bunch of other books. You can get them on your phone. We're not going to, we will open it up a little bit later. So last week we added some, some questions here about right one and two, about all the different options for things, even why a liturgy and all that. We'll talk about all that. Are there other questions about the prayer book before we get started to see if we can cover them today? Yes. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So the handout I gave you, the first part, the first part is just a little bit of, of thoughts about the, the prayer book, but then pages two and three of that are kind of what is where. It's terrible. It's the worst organized book in the world. It's like walking into a library, right? And there's obviously very smart people that know where things are in the library. I'm not one of them, right? I'm not one of the people that can, I mean, I can tell you morning prayer starts on page 55, I think, or 52. Eucharist starts on 355, because like I turn to those all the time. But if you ask me like where the prayers are, I'm like, I don't know. Where's the cat? I don't know. I don't know where any of this stuff is. It's the worst organized book in the world. And then even when you get into it, Right, like even the layout's complicated, and we'll talk about all that in a minute. This is a graphic designer and book publisher who I think lives in Atlanta. Her name is Kate, um, what is it, Kate Tynes. She became Episcopalian, asked the same question. We're like, why is this thing so crazy? So she laid out her own Book of Common Prayer. And so, like, you know, all these, like this is the colics. Our colics are just very poorly organized. You can't tell, like, what are words you're supposed to say and what are words that are supposed to tell me as the priest what to do. We'll talk about all that. So there are people who have tried to improve upon it. It's kind of a lost cause. It's a really, <laughs> it's a really terrible book. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Organization's a big thing. That's why it's really hard, right? Like, you know, when you came to my office, you were like, hey, can I have a book of common prayer to, to think? And I handed it to you and I think I said, like, good luck. <laughs> right? It's really hard. Like, you know, there's this 18 year old who's been coming to church some, and he asked today, he's like, hey, can I borrow a book of common prayer? He's like, because I like to do these offices. And so I, I handed him one, and I said the same thing. I was like, like, this is really hard. Like, the offices start on this page, and you can use these. Everything else, it gets really confusing really fast. So we'll talk some about that. Any other questions before we get started? Hey, John. All right, so we'll talk a little bit of history um, first. That's left over. So, this is what it used to look like. The, I'm surprised it says the, and this is the original faceplate, instead of like ye. Bookie of common prayer, and like they just break things over lines. Administration of the sacraments and other rites and ceremonies of the church. That's the name of this book. We call it the Book of Common Prayer, but it's a really long name. So here's the timeline. We trace our lineage back to King Henry in the early 1540s-ish, the er early part of the 16th century before all this happened. King Henry, we'll talk about this next week. He um, took England, along with Archbishop Cramner, into the Reformation, right? It was happening in other places. This is our contribution. He died. King Edward came around and started to formalize it. So in 1549, the first Book of Common Prayer this thing was published. Um, Archbishop Cramner, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, he took a whole bunch of things that were in different places, put it in one book with the goal of helping folks to be able to worship at home. We can talk about some of the layout in a little bit, but all that happened in 1549. And then he died, so we'll jump here, right? Right here, Edward, Book of Common Prayer. 
He died. Lady Jane Grey became queen for like a week and a half. She didn't do anything, right? Like, it takes a long time to change these, so she couldn't do it. Then Queen Mary, who was Catholic, came in, made some changes to the Book of Common Prayer, because remember, like King Edward, he was kind of breaking away a little bit from the Catholic Church, and so there was a lot of Protestant stuff in the Book of Common Prayer. Queen Mary was more Catholic, and so they had to have a new. So, right, she's queen in 1553, and so you go back. Here, there's some changes there. And then Elizabeth comes in, and in 1559, there's another one where um, she leans more on the Protestant side. So there's a bunch of back and forth, right? Like the Reformation wasn't clean in England, right? These siblings and like this family members, like they're killing each other over, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Protestant. They did that for a really long time. Um, Then Queen Elizabeth comes in. Elizabethan settlement is a term you've probably heard, where she finally said, enough with this. This is where the idea of the via media, right? Anglo-Catholic. Like, you'll hear that. We're, we're Protestant, the Anglo side. We're Catholic, the Catholic side. We're going to figure out how we're going to be the church that's both of those. That's the Elizabethan settlement. And so, 1604, there's a new book of common prayer. And that goes on for a while. Um, That's, so I'll look that up. Size of so next week we're going to do. Probably right, and so this is all of England, right? So this is the Anglican Church. Um, we'll get to the top line is Church of England. The bottom line is us. Um, so size of we'll talk about this next week. Next week we're going to do all of church history in like fifty minutes. Size of. Anglican. Still is. Yeah. And so it broke off. And that's basically all of England. And, you know, you had some, you know, the Scots. Yeah. There, there are now, like, it's a multi-faith and all that. But then, like, basically the whole country would have been. And so all of this, these were all published by the crown. Right? And so the crown, like, can do whatever they want. Yeah, and so 1662, I think King James was still king. I can't remember. No, whoever comes after James the first. 1662, they finished it. Basically, you know, in 1611, we talked about they finally got the Bible right. The King James Version. Jesus came down and said, y'all nailed it. That's it. 1662, same thing. He said, y'all nailed it. Jesus came down and said... You know, you're done. 1662, that's the prayer book that they still use. And so, like, the Queen's funeral, that's the 1662 service. That's fudging a little bit because there's, like, common worship. There's other books that have come since. But for their official things, for everything official in the Church of England, the prayer book that's still in force there is 1662. So, American history lesson, surprise. Like, we all used to be British, and then, like... We decided we didn't want to be British anymore, and so we fought a war with them. And so we needed to stop praying for the queen, right? because if, if, or the king at that time. Like, if we're, if we're trying to overthrow and do all of that, we probably ought not pray for the guy. So 1789, which is revolutionary time, like all of that together, like it's all mixed in in there, is when we decided we're no longer going to be the Anglican Communion or the Anglican Church in the United States. We become the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America, PECUSA. And so we published our first book of common prayer, 1789. That lasts for like 93 years or whatever. Until 1892, there's some minor changes. Then 1928, who here has worshipped with 1928? A lot of people. And, and, Jesus. and Jesus. So in the American church, right, so... So Jesus, Jesus went to Britain in 1662 and said, y'all nailed it. Jesus came here in 1928 and said, y'all nailed it. Right? And so there's a lot of people. And so that lasted about 50 years. And then in 1979, which we talked about, um, this is post-Vatican II. We talked about a couple weeks ago, biblical language and kind of the, the changes in 
Christian language, the way we talk about things and the way we describe things. It was like in the 1960s. And so the 79 Book of Common Prayer is a product of that. And we can talk about that later. There's some ideas and prayers and all of that in there that's really a reflection of kind of the post-Vatican II, 1960s, the space race, right? All of those things are in there. Um, this is what everyone knows now. This is the only prayer book my kids, our kids have known. There's some people who cling dearly to the 28 Book of Common Prayer. There's one church in our diocese that is still authorized to use this on Sunday mornings. It's St. Thomas in Houston. My good buddy is the rector there. He is the weirdest guy. <laughs> Sorry, David, if you're watching, David. I love him. Elizabeth used to be the head of lower school at St. Thomas, and so they would do um, morning prayer at her school chapel, the 28 prayer book every week. It's a, we'll talk about some of the differences and some of the changes. So, in 1979, there's talk now about do we need to make some changes. There's some flaws in the Book of Common Prayer. Number one, we have a different understanding of what marriage language should look like, right? It's no longer do you man take this woman, right? And so do we need to have a new book or do we need books? That's a whole other question, and that's probably beyond the scope of this. So there's our history timeline. This is what it looks like now, right? Like we started, this is Book of Common Worship. This is what a lot of folks in England will worship with day to day. You can see this is us. These are different languages, all these things. Every province of the Anglican Church has their own authorized Book of Common Prayer. So there's a New Zealand Book of Common Prayer. All the African countries that are on there, they all have their own. Uh, the Anglican Church in North America, right? Which I, they're not a province of the Anglican Church. That might be a surprise to them. But, <laughs> but, but they see themselves like they're Anglican. That's how they approach the world. They published a new Book of Common Prayer in 2019, right? And so all of these places have their own thing. And so it gets really big. And here's a quote by a priest and poet and scholar. To the 17th century layman, the prayer book was not a shiny volume to be borrowed from the shelf on entering the church and carefully replaced on leaving. It was a beloved and battered personal possession, a lifelong companion and guide to be carried from the church to the kitchen, to the living room, to the bedside table. Amen. This isn't something that just like goes in the rack and we read from it and then we put it back in the rack. That's what we do, but like, it was designed to be used. So, we talked about the timeline, we talked about all that. Cramner, when he got the prayer book, when he wanted to do all this stuff, he took the monastic hours, right? You think about monastic communities, they wake up like eight times, 12 times, whatever it is, and they pray. That's part of their ritual. Cramner wanted to help replicate that for the home, and so that's why we have morning prayer, noonday prayer, evening prayer, and Compline. Four, day, four hours of prayer throughout the day. And there's people that do that. There's places that do that. We, at St. Martin's, do morning prayer every day, Monday through Friday, um, on Zoom. And so that's part of that practice. And so Cranmer, what he wanted to do in the Book of Common Prayer is not make it some fancy thing that you just used in church, but it's so you could go home, open it up, and pray we've already established like it's really hard to open this book and know what to do with it um, but that's the idea behind it so we'll talk about that in a minute we're going to go through some ideas but I said the other day right I brought in a couple of books that help you understand the Bible here's all the books that help you understand the prayer book the Oxford Guide to the Book of Common Prayer the Oxford American Prayer Book Guide, because Oxford has to do two of them, right? <laughs> Liturgical Sense, The Theology of Right. Here's a book, How You Can Use the Prayer Book for Formation. Maybe I should have read that before this class. <laughs> here's, like, you know, the idiot's guides to whatever. So here's Lent, Holy Week, Easter. Here's Prayer Book and Occasional, or Pastoral and Occasional Liturgies, Ceremonies of the Eucharist, Pastoral Liturgies. So these are what priests open up. Like, when it gets to be Lent, and Phyllis and Denise ask me, what do you want to do for all these Lent services? I don't know. What does this guy say we should do? <laughs> right? And so here's, like, the Cliff's Note. Well, it's not Cliff's Notes because it's actually longer than what's in there. <laughs> the Liturgy Explained. 
Another, here's another commentary on the prayer book, right? Because you can't just have two of them. You've got to have three of them. Here's Praying Shapes Believing, a theological commentary on the Book of Common Prayer. If you're going to read one book on the prayer book, it's this. I don't think it looks like this anymore. This is old. It's called Praying Shapes Believing. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? If you remember Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi, when we talked about what we believe, this is... It goes through the prayer book and it says, you know, our belief as Christians, particularly of the Episcopal variety, are in here. I don't actually know what else is all in here. There's a ton of stuff. I have a whole shelf in my office, obviously, that is stuff on the prayer book. A user's guide to the Eucharist, opening the prayer book, the real prayer book. This is the guy who was with Jesus when they came down in 1662. Here's a manual for clergy and a priest handbook. This is actually, this sits on my desk. I use this all the time. I mean, this tells you what to do with your hands. This tells you, like, why is the Virgin yelling at me? This is like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, when should you do special processions? All of this. These are all in there. So it's actually harder to understand the prayer book than it is to understand the Bible, maybe. Um, so if you open up this book and you wonder, like, the technical stuff, like, why is the stuff jumping around? You're not alone. There's like whole disciplines. Like many, many PhD dissertations have been written on the prayer book and all of that. So we will walk through the prayer book a little bit. The main thing, most folks use the prayer book for the Eucharist. We'll get to that in a little bit. The second thing folks use it for is the daily office. Yeah. So the daily office is if you use the prayer book at home, you're going to um, use this or there's apps or websites where you can find all this stuff. And so the offices are laid out as uh, it starts with morning prayer, right? And then evening prayer. Those are the two big offices. And then you'll find another section in there that's, um, you know, devotions for for families, which are like one page each. This is what I've done, the times. You know, last week, last week I made some confessions around stewardship. This week I'll make some confessions around personal prayer. I'm like the worst at this, right? The boys and I don't pray all the time. Like, life's crazy. If you have kids, you just know, right? But the times I have devotions for families in the prayer book, they have one page that you can do morning, noon, um, evening, and then nighttime. It's real simple. You can memorize them pretty easily. You can go through that. And so that's all set up in the daily offices. The idea behind the offices, what Cramner was trying to do was the rhythm, right? Like this is, this is how we pattern our days, right? You wake up and you do this. You take a break at lunch. And then when the day is done at work, you do this. And before you go to bed, you do that. That's the general idea behind like these fourfold offices. The other's repetition, right? Like you're going to memorize these things. You know, you can look out and I usually announce page numbers or we have the words on the screens, but it's not too long before you start to, to pick up on the language. Especially folks who've been here a long time, you don't actually need the prayer book to say these things because the repetition gets it stuck in your brain. And someday I'll visit you and you won't know my name, you won't know your husband's name, but you'll be able to say the Lord's Prayer, <laughs> right? It's like the last thing you're going to remember is the Lord's Prayer because you pray it all the time. And maybe Psalm 23. People remember that too. So that's kind of the, what the offices are. It's the thing that we're supposed to do four times a day, every day. I don't. I, I was a better Christian before I went to seminary because I actually, <laughs> right, like I did, right? Like I, the first thing I would do when I was a business guy, I would go to my office and before anything else happened, I would pray morning prayer. Like I, pretty religiously, like every day. That doesn't happen anymore because well, I'm a worse Christian. Sem seminary has a way of doing that. Any questions about the offices? You should let people know. If you come to the morning prayer, it lasts about 10 minutes. Yeah. It's not an hour. Yeah. It's not an hour. No. Yeah, so worship. Yeah, so that's a, 
If you show up for worship at almost any Episcopal church, it's going to be about an hour to an hour and 15. That's about what it takes to sing all the hymns to get through the liturgy. If you go to a morning prayer in a church or an evening prayer in a church, it's going to take about 30 minutes. If you add in the canticles, the, the hymns and things like that. If you're doing the daily um, devotions for families or if you're doing morning prayer on like these compact forms, it's 10 minutes or less. So it's like if you open up morning prayer. Yeah. Yeah, and if you open up the prayer book and pray morning prayer yourself, including the readings for that week, which we'll talk about how you find those in a minute, you're in on your own for about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how long the psalm is, basically. And so these are, it's not meant to take up four hours of your day or any of that. It's meant to be when you're having breakfast or when you break for lunch, you can use a portion. Noonday prayer is super short. Noonday prayer, there's no extra scripture. It's like a page and a half in the prayer book. You're done in like three minutes. Right. These are this. It's not about like a huge investment in time. It's taking a break and recentering ourselves. It's the repetition. It's the rhythm. Any questions about the daily offices? Rites. We talked about right one and two. So rites are um, basically the way we use them is different languages. So right, like the idea of right, is the liturgy itself, the pattern of the worship. We in the 79 Book of Common Prayer have two rites, right one, right two. Right one, we don't do that here, but it's going to use thee and thou, the language Jesus approves of, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's going to use the older language. Right two is going to say you and we um, in more modern language. The 79 prayer book was kind of written, again, it's coming out in the 60s and the 70s is when this thought's around it. Just think about what's going on in the world, right? There's um, people are trying to get rid of authority, right? There, people aren't going to tell me what to do. Like, just think about the 60s and 70s. Then you have the whole Vatican II where things getting de-ritualized, deformalized, even in the Catholic Church. All of that is expressed here, and so they wanted to have options of diversity. Right one is also, um, there's some politicking going on here, some statesmanship, right? Because the people who like the 28 Book of Common Prayer really love the thee and the thou. Cause, and so we'll leave it in there. There's some argument that it was supposed to be in there for a little bit of time, and then we'd get around before 50 years had passed, we'd get around to revising it and, and getting rid of that. It stuck around, there's some people that still love it. But it kind of started as a, as a compromise a little bit. <laughs> Phyllis has to die before we can get rid of right, right one, apparently. Is no. it otherwise the same? When you the no. It's not. it's not. So generally, it's the same. Like if you think about the way our service flows, we, we gather, we sing an opening hymn. We have a collect, which I'll talk about collects in a minute, but that's kind of an opening prayer that summarizes the readings of the day, sets our mind on what's going to happen. Then we hear the word of God, both in scripture and in preaching. And then we um, recite the creed together. We um, pray together. I'm trying to remember the order. Then we pray for the nation and the world. There's like six things we have to pray for. There's forms of the prayers in there, and we always pick from one of them, except for like right now we're not. But we could use any language we want as long as we pray for six things, which I'll talk about in a minute because I have to think about what they are. <laughs> then we confess and are absolved, and then we have the peace, and then we make Eucharist together. That's the service. Right one and right two are going to look similar. The main differences are... How am I going to put this nicely? Places who still use the 1928 Book of Common Prayer tend to be more conservative. And some of that is embedded in the theology of it. So if you think about 79, what is, um, what's the central part of our worship? The Eucharist. That wasn't the case in 1928. Most churches probably didn't have Eucharist. Right? Um, they would have morning prayer. And the Sundays they had Eucharist, they would have the morning prayer service and then tack on Eucharist at the end. So when you're coming from the 28 prayer book where Eucharist isn't the center of worship, 
Rite 1 maintains some of the language and theology around that, but even Rite 1, the Eucharist is still the center. Um, and so there was some, some massaging there. But even if you look at um, Rite 1, there's some prayers that you can say at the beginning that, that are options. They're not options at, in Rite 2, but you can um, call the comfortable words. Right? The priest stands up, and kind of before everything begins, the priest basically says, um, we're all sinners, we're all going to die, but Jesus came to save us. Right? And so that sets kind of a tone for the whole service, right? Like, okay. It, it humbles. Also, so that's a more conservative view of Scripture. Like when we, before anything else starts, we talk about how much we need God's saving help. We actually don't talk about that a ton in the Episcopal Church, if we're doing right to. Then you go, basically everything else is kind of the same. And then in the Eucharist, in Rite 1, my favorite prayer, and basically the whole prayer book is the prayer of humble access. It's not an option in Rite 2. I wish it were. Um, But you basically say, we are not worthy to gather up the crumbs under thy table. Right? And so before we approach the table, we're not doing it because we're great people. We're not doing it because, like, like we basically are on our knees groveling, saying, and there's scripture for that, right? Like, saying, God, it's only by your mercy. There's nothing we can do. And so it's a prayer of humble access. I don't, though it has a different page number. I should have brought my prayer book. Um, can I borrow your prayer book, Bennett? This is large print. I'm going to be able to see it. So we get in here. There's language in the Eucharistic prayer in Rite 1. Although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice. Right? That's not language you'll hear in Rite 2. We don't ever kind of outwardly say we're unworthy. It's that's a shift in theology, right? Like it's, it's more a focus on our being created in the image of God rather than a focus on our sinfulness. Both things are true, right? We are created in the image of God. And we're also sinful. Right one has more focus probably on the sinful bit and less on the other bit. And so there's a shift in that. Um, what caused that change? That, that's what I remember as a kid was the... Yeah. Um, Protestant liberalism, right? The idea, like the 60s, right? Like, think about the world. Like, it's all, that's when self-help became a thing. And, like, this is all being recorded, and so people will judge me later. But, like, we got away from, like, like, people don't talk about how, like, we can't do anything anymore. Right? You think about the 60s and 70s, and, like, I played youth sports in the 80s when participation trophies became a thing, right? Like, all of that's kind of tied up in there together. Like, we can do it all if we just, the power of positive thinking. Like, all of that's kind of in there. But some of it is just a reclamation of the centrality of Christ. Like, we don't necessarily have to, to grovel. Like, because Christ paid the price once and for all. Like, I know I sound negative and, like, I want to go back to the 28th prayer book. I don't. There's some realities about um, how we perceive our relationship with God and and all of that. But some of this language in here, we do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. Right? Like, it's just beautiful. This is why, that prayer right there is why I became an Episcopalian. The church that I went to as a 20-something was a right one parish. And, I mean, it's beautiful. And so, um, there's a shift in that. The theology has gotten more into... God's saving love for us rather than our need as broken people. There's still some of that in there. We still have a thing in here called the penitential order. We'll do that. Like um, when Lent comes around, we're going to do the great litany and we're going to pray that. That's going to take like 25 minutes. We're going to, it will. I mean, we're going to march around the church and you'll hear us and someone, not me, is going to chant it and it's beautiful and haunting and we kind of lay out we're broken beyond repair, and it's only by. So, like, we still have that in, in our service today. Um, 
but for the rights. So part of it is diversity. We want to have options. Because like I said, the Book of Common Prayer in England is still 1662. Very few churches over there still probably use that because they use one of those other books that I showed or they kind of just make it up. Which they're not supposed to do. Um, and so part of the diversity is, hey, we get to check some things off the list. Are right. going to switch from right two to right one? No. Like so here's another thing. A lot of places do that because Lent is a penitential season. And so a lot of churches will switch from right two to right one. My thought behind that is, is that says that right one is the only thing that can be penitential. I think there's other things we can do in the Eucharist to be penitential rather than like switching to this language. What does penitential mean? Pen, um, penitent. So repentance, the root in there is penitent. Um, Sorrowful, okay, apology, yeah. Beat yourself, up. beat yourself up, yeah. So that's right one and right two. And then once we get into, um, in right one, there's a couple different op options for the Eucharistic prayer. In right two, there's four options, A, B, C, and D. We're doing prayer A, right? Starts on page 361 or whatever I say every week. And then if you turn the page B and C and D, they all follow the same formula, but they give a little bit different language. They all have a little bit different flavor to them. And we rotate through, like when Advent comes around, we'll switch um, probably to B, because B has more language in there about Mary, right? Um, C is the most different. C has a lot more call and response. C was newly written, A, B, and D are all kind of revisions or updates of previous Eucharistic prayers. C was written for the 79 Book of Common Prayer. And so you'll hear in there, and that's the one where we pray for the, or we talk about the planets, the moons, the stars, and their courses, right? Yeah, and in the, in the prayers, in the prayers of the people, in the prayers of the people for that one, we also talk about those who travel by land, sea, air, or space, because in 1979, right? We're trying to beat those Russians. And so we're going to pray for the people, right? Like literally, like part, the space race, the space race hugely influenced the Book of Common Prayer. We, can, we obviously, we're going to have these people going to space all the time, right? Like, and so some of that is like, we got to pray. We got to have books in our prayer book so we can pray when folks are taking Elon Musk's ship up to the Star Hotel. C is so penitential with the, we are sinners and your yeah. and all that. Yeah, and so, but here, right? C is, one, C is one that you'll hear a lot of, of griping about um, why we need new language. So here, um, where did it go? Yeah, so the second petition, basically. From the primal elements you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation. We turned against you and betrayed your trust. We turned against one another. What do you think could be problematic with that language? Coming from the sea. Do what? Coming from the primal. No. I mean, th so there you could question. Well, is everyone blessed with memory or reason or skill? What does this say about differently abled people? Right? So there's all those other things, but there's even here, like there's a diversity question here. There's some people who are born, they have no skill, right? They have no memory. They maybe can't reason. Like, or people who have um, traumatic brain injury, all of this. Like, there's language embedded because, like, what we pray means things. It's not just things we say, right? And so I have one of my best friends, Ian, is a priest in Savannah, Georgia. His son um, was diagnosed with, with autism, right? And so in all of his working through this, he does a lot of work with thinking about prayer C and the way that we talk about how people are supposed to be and the way people are. And Ian himself has since been diagnosed with, with autism as well. And so just the way the human brain works, like this says it works one way. And I think we all know the human brain works lots of ways. And so how do we have language in here that can reflect that? And so it's not just like our belief about God and our relationship with God that can change the language in the prayer book. It's also our understanding, our unfolding understanding of how the world works, right? Um, yeah. 
Um, I love prayer C. You know, you got to take the, the space, galaxy, suns, the planets and their courses. Some of that's beautiful writing. Some of it's like this, they found some out of work science fiction writer to help write it. Um, yeah. And then, so you'll hear A, B, and C at St. Um, Martin's, probably pretty regularly. D, I don't, D is long. It's really long. And so it, I mean, it adds a good chunk of time to the service. And so some choices when it comes to liturgy have to do with how long people's attention spans are, how long, right? Like some of this gets to be really, really long. And so D is one of those. It's beautiful. It's based on the older of the Eucharistic liturgies that, that we found. Um, so it's really beautiful, but it's really old. So diversity. That's why we have four options. There's even also um, what they call right three. There's a, an order of Eucharist in the prayer book. I forget which page it's on. But it outlines, as long as you do these things, you gather, you read and respond to God's word, right? It's reading the scripture. You pray for the, the church and the world, and you have Eucharist. As long as you do those four things, the words don't really matter, right? So we can do that, and we'll do that at other services. It's supposed to follow a prayer book liturgy, so write one or write two Eucharistic prayers, one, two, A, B, C, or D, at the principal Eucharist, which for us is 1030. So maybe if you show up at 8 o'clock someday, we may do something completely weird and different, although probably not, because like Jen Duncan would kill me, and you, and all you other 8 o'clockers. No. No, but so that's another thing is the principal service you are supposed to do from the prayer book. These are the things that are authorized. If we do anything that's not in the prayer book, I'm supposed to write the bishop and ask for permission to do things. When it's not the principal service, you can use other resources, the New Zealand prayer book, the Spanish, you know, Latin American prayer books, things like that. Um, we also, I don't have them in printed copies because um, they're all online. There's a thing called Enriching Our Worship. There's supplements to the prayer book. They're authorized to use. You probably won't ever hear those at St. Martin's. Um, some of them are, um, some of them deal specifically with really hard issues. Like there's one that's just around like the death of children, right? Yeah. It's kind of the only resource, so um, it's in there. Some of them are just gender-neutral language around the Eucharist. So there's, I think, six or seven enriching our worships. We call them EOW. Some of them are um, new language in marriage rites, new language in the Eucharist that, that take out, like, he and she type language. But, yeah, one of them that is liturgies for child loss and both... Um, pregnancy loss and like infant loss. So it's really hard stuff. But like we have to have these prayers because right, like these are situations in which no amount of preparation can make you ready for it. We'll talk about that in a little bit here about why we actually write words down and don't just like make it up as we go along. So I think we talked about the theology, how it's embedded in the, the words we say, the commonality. The idea there is generally you go to any Episcopal church in the country and you're going to hear basically the same thing. You go to any Anglican church around the world, and if you understand the language, it's going to look basically the same. They'll use different words for things because they'll make it their local custom, but we're going to gather in God's name. We're going to read and respond to Holy Scriptures. We're going to um, pray for the world, and we're going to make Eucharist. And kind of that fourfold thing. Like It's kind of like you go to Starbucks anywhere in the world, right? And they're going to have different language for the drinks. Or McDonald's, right? Um, you may get one thing or that's a little bit different in some places, but like you're going to get a Big Mac. You're going to kind of know what you're getting into. So that's the idea behind the rites in the Book of Common Prayer. So, lectionary. This is, there's a bunch of these. There's two sets of lectionaries that we use. One is, and the prayer book has it in there, um, page 888 here, and this one's actually updated. As long as it was printed after like the year 2000 or something, it used to have a pre-revised um, lectionary, and now we have what's called the revised. 
So the Revised Common Lectionary, a whole bunch of different denominations, not just the Episcopal Church, got together and said, what are the scriptures we need to hear on Sundays, and set them out into a three-year cycle. So like right now, we're working our way through. We did 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, then we're going to do Thessalonians. Right? Like we read through. Right now we're reading through Jeremiah. Is that what was this morning? And we've done Lamentations. Like we work our way through. Um, we're finishing up the Gospel of Luke because we're in year C. We're in the third year. And so the Gospel has mainly been from Luke this year. On November 27th, Advent 1, the new lectionary year starts. So we'll go to lectionary year A. The main gospel that's read all year will be Matthew, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There's three years. And so the idea is if you come to church every week for three years, number one, thank you if you do that. <laughs> but number two, you'll hear most of the scripture. That's not exactly true. There's... Um, there's some books that are skipped, like some of the harder Old Testament books you won't ever hear on a Sunday. Um, there's some harder passages that are skipped that you'll never hear on a Sunday. But generally, it's the same cycle. And again, that's commonality, right? And so you go to any Episcopal church, you go to any Anglican church, kind of any mainline church, so Presbyterian, Methodist, us, even Catholics use the Lutheran, Lutheran yeah. I try to forget about those. <clears throat> no, um, they all kind of hear the same readings. So again, it's a commonality thing. Um, some people change readings each week. We won't ever do that. Yeah. Oh, so John is used. So John is, um, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. They're all kind of the same thing. They're written in the same structure and format. They tell kind of the same stories of Jesus' life. John is a theological commentary on Jesus' life. So, it's a, yeah, it's absolutely a gospel. It's one of the four gospels. It's not one of the synoptics. We do John during Advent and Lent. It comes up a lot, and it's used for, like, holy days because the language in John is beautiful, right? Like, like I think Christmas Day, I don't know if it's Christmas Eve, but Christmas Day, John 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word... Is it first Sunday after Christmas? Okay. See, I have to ask the head of the, the readers. Because, like, I don't ever know, right? Like, I, I don't have these things memorized. Like, I'd look at a website, lectionarypage.net. You can go there. It'll have a whole calendar. You can look at all next year. And, like, I click on the week, and it gives me the readings, right? So, yeah, John doesn't get picked up in the normal year. Um, it's used for special occasions because it's, it is differently written. Yeah. So we talked here, structure, common, missing. There's big things. Like we actually do read from Philemon. We do it in year C a couple weeks ago. You read the whole thing. Philemon is 21 verses long, right? Like I'm actually surprised it made it into the lectionary. But every New Testament book is in the lectionary. Um, not every Old Testament book is. So it's always interesting, and I'll do this a lot, and if you've been around here enough, you've, you've seen, like, if we skip from one, we've done it in 2 Timothy and 1 Timothy, we skip big check sections. And so I'll comment and I'll preach on some of the missing stuff, because I think it's important that we talk about the things that um, we don't put in there, because sometimes it's really hard stuff. Sometimes it's just really confusing, um, so it's not just hard. I think the people who made the lectionary were trying to give preachers a break. <laughs> Both. Yeah, some of it is, although like the psalm we had, I mean, we chanted about dashing babies' heads against rocks the other day in our psalm, right? And so we do have some stuff in there that's hard. Um, in the Old Testament, yeah, the psalm a couple weeks ago, we ended chanting the psalm because in the psalm, it talks about dashing babies' heads against the rocks. Why? I don't know. I mean, so there's a passage. So this is a, a plug for... Um, the podcast I do, we're going through scripture, not verse by verse, but we're working our way through. And, and one of the things we do each week is we talk about what are the things we don't read. And so a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago at this point, um, one of the priests in the way old times, there was a prostitute in the town. And as a warning to the other tribes around, they chopped up this prostitute and mailed her parts. 
right? That's in the Bible. We don't ever read it on a Sunday. <laughs> Although, like, I'd love to preach a sermon on this, and like, I don't, it'd be, that's an interesting thought exercise. So, like, you think about, okay, here's, here's an aside. You know, we're into banning books these days, and there's a big controversy in school districts around here. One of the books that was requested to be banned was the Bible. I think if you look at all the books that are on that list, the Bible might ought to be the one that is banned because in it, it has all the hot, it has murder, it has abortion, it has all these things. It has like ritual sacrifice of your enemy. All these things are in there, right? Like literally everything that you want to check all these other books on the list and say we can't have those, you can find literally all of it in the Bible. They're not going to ban the Bible because, you know, in God we trust. <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, so, um, but like the lectionary, so that's one lectionary. That's the Sunday Eucharistic lectionary. When you're doing morning prayer, you are going to read all of this. And I can remember in seminary, like there's just funny stuff in the Bible too. Like we'll never read it on a Sunday, but there's something in the Old Testament where they're like getting ready for war and they're talking about all these things and they're like, and we mounted our herd of elephants. And like I remember reading this and I just like caught the giggles in morning prayer and like I can't stop laughing at this idea of these Israelites like going to war riding mount elephants right and so there's this funny stuff you do read through everything in the the daily office lectionary it's a two-year cycle because right like we have to have a three-year cycle and a two-year cycle and so you think about you're a musician right like if you're doing like half time and third time you're like switching and you're like trying to figure out where am I and, and all of that um, so if you do morning prayer uh, with our group or on your own, there's a cycle for that. And there's even a psalm lectionary where, like, you can pray through the psalms once every month. Like, you get through all 140 psalms in 30 days. That's why morning prayer sometimes takes 35 minutes, because the psalms get to be really, really long, and half of it is that. Um, but that's all part of the prayer book. Like, when they set out to do this, they set out to not just make the worship accessible, but also give us a pattern for how we read the Bible, right? We're not saving like that quote that we had, that the prayer book's not just this fancy thing you leave in the pew, but it's something you take home and use. We're Episcopalians, so the Bible is something that like Io holds up and reads from. Um, but no, the Bible's also something, right? Like, like I would love if people like brought their Bible to church and right, like did all that. We don't typically do that as a tradition. But the idea in the Book of Common Prayer is not just to pattern our prayer life, but also how we read scripture. It becomes a part of everything. And so, right, there's a knock on Episcopalians that like we don't read the Bible, whatever, because we don't. But you come in, every three years we're going to read through the whole Bible. I literally don't get to pick what I preach on, right? I wish I could just pick like the greatest hits and like, let's just spend all year preaching on John. Like that sounds fun. No, I also have to preach on Philemon, right? And wrestle with that. I also have to preach on that. And so, when your buddies say, you go to a church that doesn't read from the Bible, say, we actually read from all of the Bible and leave it there. <laughs> all right, rubrics. This is another thing. This is why we have this whole stack of books here. Rubrics, rubrics is Latin for red. And so it used to be in the olden days when we could afford two color printing, the, the stuff we say was in black and now we italicize it. And so if you wonder why like here, um, you know, this is Palm Sunday. There's this whole thing in italics that says, when the liturgy of the palms immediately precedes the Eucharist, the celebration begins with the salutation and collect of the day. That means nothing to y'all. But like Phyllis and I know that that means this is what the bulletin needs to look like and how we start. That used to be in red. Now it's in italics. And everything that's not in italics are the words we pray. And so also in the prayer book, that's one of the reasons it's so confusing. Is like we mix the script with the blocking, right? So instead of just everyone having the script and like the participants being able to follow along in the script, you're also seeing like the priest is supposed to walk here now and the priest is supposed to do this and everyone else is supposed to do that. And so you see all these other things and you're like, that seems crazy. And so it's all, that's the multiple uses of the prayer book. One is it's a personal devotion device but it's also the mechanics of what you're supposed to do, which obviously the rubrics aren't enough because we got this whole stack of books down here. Um, but that's one of the things that makes it so confusing. Um, 
Oh, and then the may. You'll see if you read the rubrics, like if you get bored, you'll see some things says may do it, right? Like if you ever wonder why we don't always say the Nicene Creed, right, on a Sunday morning, or why we don't always say the confession and absolution on a Sunday morning. We won't, have, we won't do the confession and absolution during the Sundays of Easter, right? Because the rubrics say, you know, here is, here the confession is said, except during Easter and um, except during the Easter season and other times is appropriate. Like there are some options to take things out. Like if it's not a Sunday morning, if you come on a Thursday morning Eucharist, we're not gonna say the Nicene Creed. Um, not for other things, that's just my habit, right? Um, because you don't have to say it. You have to say it on major feasts and typically Sunday mornings, but other times you won't. And there's other things like that that you don't always have to do. Um, that'll be signified by May. And so if you have questions about why we're not doing something, it's not always that I forgot. Sometimes it's that I forgot. Sometimes it's because we planned not to do it. Any questions about that? Okay. So we talked about these prayers. Uh, we talked a little bit about organization of the book. Um, yeah, there's on the notes that I handed out, there's kind of a, a summary of what's in there. And you think about it, right? The whole first part of it is it starts with the calendar. But this calendar is out of date already. It was out of date the moment it was printed. You can go online. There's like four or five. These are called sanctorial calendars um, is what it's called. It's, which sanctorial is like sanctified, holy. It's a calendar of holy days. There's a couple of them that have been authorized by the Episcopal Church. Um, we don't ever do them on Sundays because Sunday Eucharist takes precedence over any holy day except for some, all saints can be transferred. That's why we do all saints on a Sunday instead of making y'all come up here on like a random Wednesday or whatever. Some places do the midweek services. You can, your patron feast day you can move and so we'll do the readings and everything for Feast of St. Martin on a Sunday instead of the day that it's supposed to be. Those may be the only ones you can move around. Yeah, there's a list in here somewhere. Um, but like, yeah. Okay. Feast of the Holy Name, the Presentation and Transfiguration. The Feast of the Dedication of Church, Feast of its Patron. Um, yeah. With express permission of the bishop and for urgent and sufficient reason, some other special occasion may be observed on a Sunday. I can't for the life of me imagine what an urgent reason would be to like celebrate a feast day. Right? Like these aren't like life or death things. Yeah. We yeah. And so some of this is like, like we don't tell the bishop, I'll stop recording. Some of these things like everyone does, but like you're not supposed to. Right. Epiphany. There are some places like if you go to the cathedral, they're going to do the Sunday worship services, but like they'll have epiphany on a weekday. They'll have daily, they'll do all of that. And so the beginning of this is all the calendars where you can see Julia Chester Emery. She started the United Thank Offering. Um, I, I used to help out at the cathedral in Upper South Carolina, and I remember preaching on that because they, for the daily Eucharist, they would do these days. And so you'd be told, like, you've got to come up with something about this saint. All these. So every month has them. What's today? Today's the... Yeah, so we'll talk about that in a minute. What day is today? Today? 16th. Yeah, so today is the feast of Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. Hey, look at this. Today is the feast of Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury. I didn't even plan this. We're celebrating the guy on his feast day. Um, so there, Christmas, if you come to Christmas Day service here, it's going to be like me and Phyllis and my two kids. It's actually a Sunday this year. Well, Christmas Day, yeah. Yeah, because everyone comes on Christmas Eve, right? This year, Christmas Eve is on a Saturday, and so we're going to have four services on Christmas Eve. We're going to have a 3, a 5, an 8, and a 1030, <laughs> because I've been told as long as Keen is here, and, you know, Keen's the guy who hired me, and so we're always going to have that. I love the 1030 service. Like, some of my fondest memories are driving home at midnight and all that. So we'll have those. 
some churches do start doing them earlier in the week. You'll see that with mega churches. Like they start Christmas services sometimes middle of December. We actually, on December 18th, so the Sunday before Christmas, is fourth Advent. There's four Sundays in Advent. Um, so we'll have Advent 4 in the morning where we'll read the Advent readings, preparing, hearing about John the Baptist, all this stuff. And then we'll switch over. And then um, that night we're going to have our first Christmas Eve service. We call it Blue Christmas. That's an idea because for some people, for whatever reason, either loss in their life, grief over something, like you just can't do all the stuff. You don't want the poinsettias and the bells and you don't want all the crazy. You want to go and celebrate Christmas and like be sad because maybe it's your first Christmas since someone died or since whatever. So we will on the 18th, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service. Everything else will be on Christmas Eve, but we do four services there and they'll each be, well, eight and 1030 will be the same. Three and five will be a little bit different. And then we'll wake up the next morning and it's actually a Sunday. So we'll do Christmas. Actually, we won't do Christmas Day. That'll be first Sunday after Christmas. Yeah. We'll skip over the, because there's stuff in the, in the lectionary for Christmas Day. I'll have to look into that, which one we do. Yeah, I don't know, because it's a Sunday. It's the first Sunday after Christmas. That's the John Luke. Yeah, I'll look it up. Yeah, and so, you know, we'll figure that out. And so there, you know, normally Christmas Eve's on a Wednesday, right? And so, or whenever it is. Not a lot of folks wake up the next morning on Christmas Day. And I get it, because Christmas Day, you wake up and you're opening presents, you're having brunch with your family and all that. We'll always have worship here on Christmas Day, right? It's one of my favorite services. My job ruins weekends and holidays anyway. And so, like, you show up and it's just quiet and peaceful. Um, I think Bob's actually going to be here. Nor a lot of times, Christmas is just a spoken service, Christmas Day, and it's just lovely. I think we'll have music this year. Um, same thing, uh, New Year's Day is a Sunday. Right? A lot of places will have serv um, a service on New Year's Day. It's Feast of the Holy Name. Um, it's actually a Sunday, so we'll have it this year. And so we make some changes like that. Um, it's 10.15, so we're kind of wrapping up. Yeah, question. Um, well, I'd be okay greening the church for Blue Christmas. We'll probably actually wait until later so things don't die. Because if we do it on Sunday, by the time Saturday... Everything we have is fake. Not the poinsettias and such. Oh, yeah. The poinsettias go later, right? Yeah. And so that'll probably all happen the next Saturday morning, okay. would be my guess. Um, but, like, during Advent, we're going to take the frontal, which is the big white cloth off the altar. We're going to take it off. So all during Advent, all you're going to see is a table. Um, but as soon as Advent 4 is over on Sunday morning, we will put the frontal back on. And so it'll be white and beautiful as it is that night. And so we'll have all that. All right. Any other questions about this? Next week, we're going to do church history. And so come with all your questions. We'll see if we can squeeze it in. Uh, I actually have fewer books about church history than I do about the prayer book. <laughs>